The second talk in this series uh, is entitled, A Primer on Personal Prayer. Let's recall again our, our aims and goals for this, se this series. It's to renew, recapture our commitment to personal prayer and to give us the, the basic help we need to get that back in place and understand some of the main dynamics that surround personal prayer. So our goal in this talk is to clarify the need for prayer in the Christian life and to identify the key elements in prayer and the obstacles in personal prayer. So uh, I, I call this sort of, you know, focusing in um, on a topic that we've already taken up in the first talk. Uh, as I was making ready to, to drive up here, uh, Jim had given me the, uh, the address of this church. Of course, I've never been to the church before. And like most of us these days, I go online to the, you know, MapQuest or Google Maps or something like that. And you put in the name and out comes, you know, this, this map appears with this, this course. And uh, you, you know what it's like, you, okay, and then you hit this little plus button and the map just kind of gets a little bit closer. And more, more, suddenly more streets come into view and you can read the names and you, it just sort of, it, it expands before you. That's really what I want to do in the second talk here. It's like the map thing where you just increase the, 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 the scope so you're looking at it in greater detail. We've already covered the area but now we're magnifying it in order to see it more clearly. So just to remind us again, first of all, that personal prayer is a key dimension in our life with God. We say in our daily life ideal, in the sword of the Spirit, we desire to love God through lives of holiness and daily prayer and worship. Desire to love God through lives of holiness, daily prayer and worship. We say in our elements of good membership that we take a regular prayer time and of scripture and regularly of scripture reading or study. And it's really picking up on that line uh, that we're, uh, we're covering here in these talks. We're picking up on a regular prayer time and a regular time for scripture reading or study. To recall again what we said in the first session, we pray personally as an expression of our love for God when we can lift up our minds and focus on Him in a particular way and grow in our love for God. Our personal prayer is not simply an expression of how much we love Him, but how much we'd like to love Him and right now maybe don't. And I think that brings us, that, that closes the gap between what we say and where we really are. <laughs> um, when we say, I love you Lord with all my heart, that's as much an expression of our desire as our reality. And so our personal prayer is an expression of love for God, but it's also an expression of our desire that we might love God more and really get to the place where the love of God means more for us in our lives. Personal prayer is for God, first of all, but it must be said, it also is for us. It strengthens us, it blesses us, it gives us guidance. It's a way for us to receive the life of God and grace to live the life he's called us to. In other words, it's got a two, two sides to the relationship. We're here to give thanks and praise to God, but we also know that it's of great benefit to us to be in that prayer. Okay, I'm going to move from topic to topic as we go through here, and in the discussion we can take up those areas that you feel like would be of particular interest. So, What makes for a good prayer time? <laughs> this is so obvious that when you say it, you go, well, of course, I, I, I knew that, but we forget it. And we often let other things be the guide and the, and, and the measure of what our prayer time is. Uh, and we evaluate it often in ways that aren't helpful. So what makes for a good prayer time? First of all, that God is honored as we focus our attention on him and his word. Our call is to honor the Lord. Our goal is to love the Lord. Our, our call, you know, what the Lord calls us to is to give honor and glory to him. Where we are doing that, or at least where we're making every effort to do that, is a good prayer time. That's a mark of a good prayer time, that we honor the Lord well. Secondly, that we present ourselves to him fittingly as his son or daughter, thanking him, asking for help, <coughs> repenting of our sin and interceding for others. That we present ourselves in a worthy way. We were talking about this in the discussion earlier, that uh, it helps when we're distracted to have a form to actually present ourselves well so that we go about these steps in a good way. A good prayer time is also one in which we present ourselves rightly to the Lord. 
In fact, that's what a lot of good forms of prayer do. They help to present ourselves. They help us present ourselves well to the Lord and enter into what he's called us to. Thirdly, that we seek to have our minds and lives formed by his word. And I'll add the fourth here, and that we respond with faith and obedience to what he's saying to us and doing with us. We seek to have our minds formed and we respond in obedience. Just this morning, as it happened, I was reading in the prophet Ezekiel. I'm reading through Ezekiel right now. And in the chapter I was reading, it says that Ezekiel was, uh, was gathered in a certain place and the Lord said to him, a lot of the, the elders of, of Israel that are here in exile with you, they come and they listen to you and they say they want to hear my word and they come humbly. Please speak to us the word of God. And the Lord said to Ezekiel, they, they say they want to listen with their lips, but then they don't do what I tell them because their heart is not right. And I said, well, that's just the point we're making here. That's just the problem that, that we have. A good prayer time is one in which we really want to hear the, the word of the Lord, and then we do it, or we're ready to do it. We respond with obedience. It's not just going through a form of words so you can check off the fact that I took my prayer time. I put my time in. I did the duty. But we also have to come with hearts looking to hear his word and then respond to that word. Finally, that we persevere in prayer during times of dryness and difficulty. We'll say more about this later when we come to obstacles. Prayer sometimes is like a magnet that draws us. Oh, those are sweet times where we can't get enough of prayer. Just, I want to go be with the Lord. Something's going on. I want to draw, whether it's com communal prayer, personal prayer, it draws us like a magnet. But you know, sometimes when things aren't going so well, it's like a reverse magnet. You know what it's like to try to put two magnets together that you put them together and go, Mm -hmm. And it's almost like we, we think about going to prayer and we're ve we veer off. That praying actually can be painful for various reasons. And so we, we, have, we have to persevere in prayer and push through some of that in faith, knowing that the Lord's at work in that too. So those are some of the qualities that make for a good prayer time. Why say these? Because often we instinctively judge a prayer time by um, how we felt about it. And sometimes that can be a good thing. Sometimes our, how we felt about it can be a reasonable judge. But oftentimes it's not. We can feel good about something for reasons that may not have much to do with the Lord or feel bad about something that also have very little to do with the Lord. It's not just how we experienced God or whether we were happy, uh, but are we actually honoring the Lord, presenting ourselves to him, listening to his word, responding with obedience and pressing on in times of difficulty. Those are the qualities that end up making for a good prayer time. All right, well, next, let's look a, a bit at elements of our daily prayer time. What are those elements? We mentioned these before. We'll go into them in a little bit more detail here and then look at some of the aids and helps that are available to us to go about these. So this is where we're, you know, uh, magnifying the map <laughs> and looking more closely at the, at the streets and the, you know, the, the, w w what's going on here said this in the first talk too, some level of spontaneity is actually good and helpful. We don't want to get in such a rut that we just say the same thing exactly every morning. There's something about a relationship with the Lord that ought to have a, a healthy element of spontaneity. But we all know the benefit of having a regular pattern of prayer so that we don't have to make things up new every day. You don't want to have a prayer time where you say, well, I have no idea what I'm going to do today. Let's just see what God leads me in. Again, for most of us, that's not a good way to go. We're going to spend most of our time thinking about other things and not actually praying. A regular pattern not only helps us focus on the Lord, but protects us from our own weaknesses and blind spots. Because if left to just me, I'm going to do what I want to do and what I like to do. And it might be a very narrow band of what would be good to do. A form of prayer, a pattern of prayer, ensures that I cover the ground well and that I might do a set of things and attend to some things that I might not if I'm just left to my own what I'm feeling that day. It's part of the benefit of a set form and of a pattern. Okay, there's not one set pattern as I think we know. There's not, here's the formula, that's it. Everybody should do it this way. But there are key elements that ought to go into a good prayer time. And they're key elements because they're real elements of a real relationship with God. They're facets of a real relationship with God. That's why they're elements of prayer. Praise, worship, and adoration of who God is, of God for who he is. 
I don't know if you remember this, but I do recall when this was something I simply really couldn't do. Uh, I remember when I was a l late high schooler, I came up and visited uh, my older brothers and joined in some of their prayer rooms in the households and went to prayer meetings, and I thought it was all a bit strange, um, really. But I also, this was one kind of prayer I just couldn't enter into. I had no words to say. I didn't know how to adore God or praise Him. I could ask Him for things. I knew how to pray, form prayer, you know, set prayers. But to actually from my heart adore and worship the Lord, I, I didn't really know how to do that. And it really was by receiving the Holy Spirit in a fresh way, getting baptized in the Spirit, that suddenly this prayer wells up within us. Now, it's not like Christians can never learn how to do this without being baptized in the Spirit, but that certainly helps. certainly helps. It gives you something to say. You know what it is to adore and praise God. The Spirit of God in us leads us in praise and adoration of God just for who He is. This gets us away from an instrumental view of prayer where, you know, I relate to God because I want something. I'm bartering. It's my daily bartering session. Look, you know, I'll do this if you'll do that. And, Okay, yeah, yeah, all right, I know, all right, yeah, i got to do this better. But if, I'll, if I do, will you, you know, we get into the bartering session. Um, some of God's holy people bartered with the Lord on occasion. It's not like you can never do that. Moses seemed to do that on occasion. Um, so did Abraham. But it's not the main way we want to approach the Lord. Adoration puts us in a completely different posture. We adore the Lord just for who He is and are instead of bartering with him then, our intercession comes out of being united to him. And instead of just praying to him as a kind of negotiation, we pray in him and through him because we've been joined to him in our prayer. It's a very different posture for our intercession. So praise, ad worship, and adoration. Um, when you can do it and you have the ability to join with other people and lift up your voices, we all know this is a great blessing. That isn't possible in every household. Um, sometimes the the incense of, of worship lifted up may not be all that melodious um, because of, of, of gifts in, in, in the particular household. Um, I, I'm, every year it's a new surprise for me. I, I live with different sets of brothers, depending who's coming in and out. And some years it, it, um, it's a little more difficult. Other years it's, it's just absolutely wonderful because we're better at lifting up our voices together. But whether it's, it's wonderful or not, finding a way to praise and worship and adore the Lord for who He is ought, ought to be a regular part of our prayer. Thanksgiving to God for what He's done, for answered prayers. I, I'm one of those lepers that forgets to return and thank God. Um, I'm glad enough to ask, but when it's given, I'm off to the next thing. And we knew, do need to, to thank the Lord. Thank the Lord for answered prayer, but also to learn how to thank Him more deeply for just who we are, for having made us for giving us a chance to be and to have life and to know Him. So thanksgiving, again, is a part of a key relationship. It expresses something right in a relationship with God for all He gives us. Repentance for our faults and sins, speaking clearly to the Lord about these. This is easier for the humble and the scrupulous. It's much harder for the proud and the arrogant, who only only when, when you can't get out of acknowledging it will you ever want to admit you've done anything wrong. You can tell by how I said that where I am on this. I'm more the proud and the arrogant that doesn't like to admit uh, failure and, and need. Um, repentance as part of a way of life. Obviously we repent of our sin when we fall and to get into the habit of being very quick to acknowledge before the Lord and in His presence what we've done wrong, whether it's a sin of speech a sin of, of attitude, some sin of behavior, to say it, to name it, and to acknowledge it before the Lord. It's a great gift. But there's also a deeper kind of repentance. It isn't just for, I've done this twice, or I snapped at my wife, or something like that. But, uh, you know, I've given way to just the ways of the world. I've, I've loved other things. <laughs> my heart is not set on you. Um, there are deeper ways of repentance that I think even a season like the one we're in of the 40 days can help us dig out and find and discover so that our repentance isn't superficial. For most of us, we don't like repentance, so we want to make it superficial. It's like that apology you give as a kid. You should apologize to your brother. Sorry. And you know, you, it's this deep. It's, it's, uh, it's lips. 
and, and that, that's me. You know, I'd like to get it over with and move on. And allowing the Lord and, and the Spirit to actually stir up and, and deepen our repentance uh, is, I think, part of developing a deeper relationship with the Lord. And all it does is it makes us more holy and more like the Lord and gets rid of our own uh, self-deceit. Next, intercession for our needs for those of God's people and for the world. The Lord really has called us not just for ourselves, but to be at work with him in mission. We're a community of disciples on mission. Intercession, by the way, I think is one of the best ways to combat distraction. I'll say this maybe again a little later on. Most distractions, when you think about them, end up focusing on me. My anxieties, my vanities, my worries, my desire to be well-loved and appreciated. Intercession is that focusing off of me onto someone else. It automatically puts the thing in the Lord's courts. One of the best ways to get away from the distractions that focus on self is to intercede and pray for others. The love of God works in us so that we become less focused on, I want God to do something for me, and I'm ready to cooperate with the Lord to help move his kingdom forward in the lives of others. Different gifts in the way of intercession. Some, I think, have a special call to really put a lot into this, but all of us ought to make intercession a part of daily life and prayer in some way. Closely related to intercession, consecrating our day and the upcoming events into the Lord's hands. It's, it's, it's a way of bringing the Lord into life, of not saying, here's your area, now this is mine. But it's a way of bringing the Lord and showing his sovereignty over all our lives. You, you consecrate things to the Lord. And again, I'm slow to do this. Uh, I often forget to bring the Lord into the main events of the day. But that's a, that's a key way of doing it. And in a morning prayer time, looking forward, oftentimes there are obvious things coming up and consecrating those to the Lord. I've got this very difficult discussion I need to have with my son or daughter. I've got this issue at work. We've got this financial problem that's weighing on us. We've got a problem, it's a legal matter, and we're praying that God, whatever it might be, we have things in the day and in the week that need attending. Lately, we've just heard a lot about people who are uh, ill with serious disease, and so we've been spending a lot of time in intercession for the sick. It tends to come in waves, you know, and you, you hear about three, and then there's ten more, and uh, so we've spent a lot of time praying for people in that way lately. Finally, seeking his wisdom and direction for a particular area. Um, I've got a couple of these right now. They're not major areas, but I really want the wisdom of the Lord. Lord, what should I do here? This, you know, what, should I take this on or not? Seeking the help of the Lord in a regular way, asking for his guidance and counsel. Let's not forget to do that. Let's not forget to do that. The Lord wants to guide us and help us. Okay, a, a quick review of those elements. How you put those together will, will depend on your own shape of prayer, in what order, whether you major in one or have a special time of intercession or in the week or a time to do that that's different. Um, that, I think, can be left up to the individual approach or, the, or, the, or the, the household and the way you want to do some of these even together. It goes without saying that the Bible itself is a key resource for prayer. The Psalms have a very special place in shaping our prayer. They really are the prayer book of the Bible. And they not only teach us to pray, but they are prayers themselves for every conceivable occasion. They, they speak to our lives and, and allow us to take what's going on in our, li our life and have a, a, a form of prayer that allows us to pray into that, whether it's joy and delight, um, the relief of answered prayer, the sense of persecution, of loss, of, of, of distance from the Lord, of grief, whatever it might be. The Psalms can speak to us and be a, a form of prayer for us. And having some way to bring the Psalms into life, there are many ways to do that. Having some way to do it, I think, will greatly enrich our prayer vocabulary. And that, I think, is one of the things we all want to do in moving ahead. Many of us have found it helpful to have some kind of a program that assists us in our personal prayer in reading the scriptures. Some of these programmatic elements simply help us read the Word of God in the Scripture. They're just ways to do that in a little more disciplined way. Others, and many of these come from specific church traditions, build in not only the Scripture but other kinds of prayers and readings from that tradition that can enrich us and help us pray. And I want to mention a few of these uh, 
this is by no means exhaustive. There are many more out there, so this isn't meant to be a kind of, uh, this is it. But these are some of the things that are available and uh, others uh, you either know about or could find out about. Many of us have found it helpful to have a Bible reading plan. Early on in my relationship with the Lord, I found this immensely helpful, both because it kept me disciplined and because there was a little bit of, you know, competition in it or a sense of, yeah, I want to I do this, I want to do this, I want to read the Bible in a year. And, and that just helped me get motivated and get through it well. Uh, years ago, Servant Publications put out this, published this little reading thing that had both a one-year, a two-year, and a three-year plan for going through the whole Bible. I think that's still, you can still get that, for instance, on Amazon. I've purchased a couple of copies. But there's a whole set of them out there from different, different groups that are your kind of coach, sure. your daily coach saying, okay, it's you know, January the 13th, and today you've got Jeremiah 35 and 36, 37, and 1 Corinthians. You know. It sort of tells you what you're going to read that day. And that can be a great help for us in moving through the Bible. Um, for, for Catholics, there's access to a thing called the Liturgy of the Hours. I think most of us would know what that is. Uh, a collection of daily psalms, of prayers, of readings, that's mapped out for a whole set of, of different <laughs> kinds of prayer during the day. Some make use of a shorter version that has morning and evening prayer called the Magnificat, uh, that is a little bit more accessible and is easier to carry around. Uh, this can be a helpful way of, of shaping your prayer or be an element in your, in your daily prayer. Uh, for those in the Anglican tradition, there's the Book of Common Prayer. Other traditions have similar kinds of prayer books that come from their, their own uh, uh, church background. Uh, there's also a thing that's published by um, the Saint, uh, it's published by the Touchstone folks. It's called the St. James Daily Devotional Guide. And it's in actually intended to, to be a kind of an ecumenical form of prayer. This, this is a group of, of people that come from Orthodox, Catholic, and Protestant traditions. And uh, we actually uh, get that. It looks a little bit like this. It's a little pamphlet. And it has daily readings um, and uh, little descriptions. It brings in some of the, the elements from the different churches. And so it can actually be a way to get in touch with some of the wider church traditions. And yet still put us in touch with those things that are in common. There are also some Bible study programs similar to the one that I mentioned my mother was using. Um, we wanted to give a particular plug for the word among us because uh, it's associated with one of our communities. And they do a good job. And that's a, a, a monthly magazine um, written to a Catholic audience that uh, is, is mainly a scripture study guide but also offers other kinds of, of helps for prayer and study. Uh, Finally, I want to give a, a plug here for a simple tool. All of you have it in your hand that uh, is for the Sword of the Spirit here written up for the North American region. It's called a, a Pattern of Daily Personal Prayer in the Sword of the Spirit. It's a reprint um, updating of, uh, a, you know, description of corporate prayer, a bit of the when, where, and what of regular prayer. It goes over a lot of the material that we're going through this talk. Uh, it has a psalm sequence, some basic readings for going through three, a, a three-year cycle, as well as some readings and prayers for the different seasons. For those that aren't using something else already comparably or would like to use this on occasion, or this, this could be very valuable for helping give you a program for working through the scripture and the psalms in a regular way for personal prayer or even for some of the corporate family prayer. Again, this isn't a complete list or something, but I, I mentioned some of these because I know that members of our communities use them. I've had contact with a set of them, and they can be a great help in, in personal prayer. Let me just end, though, by saying that whatever pattern we choose to follow, whatever format we use, we really want our prayer to remain our personal prayer time with the Lord, that time we set aside to be with Him. And let's remember that... <laughs> The greatest guide to our prayer is the person of the Holy Spirit himself. However useful this or that format might be, it's God the Holy Spirit that leads us in our prayer. He is the main uh, one that guides, leads, and works from within to lead us 
through Christ to the Father and bring us into that communion with himself. These are great instrumental helps, but it's, it's the Spirit of God himself who is our, our primary teacher and the one that we rely on for our daily prayer. Uh, I think that's a great consolation to us that we're not just left to our own devices. All right, well, that's, uh, that's what I wanted to say here today about elements of our daily prayer time and some of the helps for it. Quite briefly, let me uh, mention a couple of in inadequate approaches to prayer. This is just meant to be one of those. You know, in case this is sort of how you're doing it, this might not be where you want to stay. Uh, the first uh, is, is a tendency to see my daily prayer time mainly as a time to rest and relax my mind. Like this is the time when I can let the hustle and bustle go, the helter and skelter of life leave, and I can have time for personal reflection, for catching my breath, and so on. Well, that may be extremely helpful for you. In fact, it might be crucial in order to get your prayer time to work well, to have a time like that or to do that. We all need that. But that's not yet quite a personal prayer time. It's almost more like daily yoga, you know, or something like that. It's, it's taking time to just kind of, you know, you know, stop and think and relax and just get that perfect cup of, of latte with two sugars, you know, and um, whatever it might be for you that sort of settles you down and makes you sort of get, get personally refreshed. That might be great, but it's not yet prayer time. And it, it, again, it's more focused on getting myself in order than it is actually attending to the Lord. If that might be preparation for prayer, wonderful. But let's make sure that we don't stop there and call that a prayer time rather than sort of catching my breath and recollecting and getting my mind clear. The second one I want to mention is in some sense the opposite. Not quite, but, but it's almost the opposite of it. <laughs> we laughingly call this the, the my life is a prayer view of things. Um, that we take our prayer time while we're driving, while we're shopping, or while we're doing the daily crossword. <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm praying all the time. Um, <coughs> It's the prayer of the distracted and busy man or woman. And in our world, I think all the more easy to do this. Everything is distracted. Everything's running. Everything is, is multitasked. I mean, heaven forbid that I just be praying and not doing something else along with it. I mean, what a waste of my time. How efficient is that, you know? But in fact, that's just what we want to do. We want to be inefficient in, in other things and be very efficient when it comes to being focused on the Lord. So we do want to stop doing other things, at least try to stop doing other things as much as possible when we're taking personal time for prayer. Let's not delude ourselves that we're actually taking a personal prayer time when we're really doing something else. Moving on to some challenges in personal prayer. This is one that could be multiplied and we could talk about for quite a while. You know, I'd start this by asking a question to us all. Uh, does anyone find personal prayer always easy, always delightful, and completely focused? <laughs> you know, please raise your hand. Um, no, normally I'd say that's not the norm for prayer. That's the exception, and when that happens, wow, that's great. I was caught up to the third heaven, or maybe even higher. But normally... That's not the case. We, we come up against challenges. We have to fight in prayer and, and wrestle. And I want to identify here three main kinds of areas and offer at most a simple encouragement in pressing through them. This isn't by any means a full treatment, but just to touch on these and to offer uh, some simple thoughts about moving past them. The first area is what we call distractions. We all know that we are easily and regularly distracted in prayer. I think it's safe to say that that's the universal experience of anyone that actually has a working brain, that you are distracted at prayer. And that it's not easy to focus. Our minds wander when we attempt to pray. Anxieties swarm like flies upon us at points. We're anxious about many things, but the Lord calls us to cast our anxieties upon him because he cares about us. What's the antidote to anxiety? Not so much to, to swat them away as if you can deflect them, maybe you can do that a bit, but to actually turn them over to the Lord. That's a better way to handle them. Cast your anxieties upon him. That will actually help us focus on prayer. 
But even if we're not anxious, our, mind will come, our minds will come up with a thousand other things to think about that we might not be tempted to think about at all were we not praying. But now that we're praying, I think I want to, you know, it's like, as long as I'm praying, you know, we, we, we think about all kinds of things. And if it's not one thing, our mind will find another. That's just the way we are. The key thing through all that, I think, is to come back to the Lord and fight through. Uh, sometimes it can be helpful to take an active response when I'm distracted in prayer or a little tired in prayer, you know, your head's nodding a bit, or um, to be a bit more active, to stand up, to be more vocal, to be more decisive in our prayer. Working with the body can help the mind. Get the body going in the right direction, doing the right things. It will aid our minds in going in the right direction. Let's be honest that for some of us, we are distracted because we're a bit bored. Because whether we would be so frank to admit it, we're a little bored with prayer. It doesn't sort of catch my fancy. I'm not excited about prayer like I once was. And one of the reasons we get distracted is because we're a little bored and our mind is looking for something a little bit more interesting. Again, all the more in this generation and culture where there are so many distractions thrown at us all day long. If that's the case, um, pray to the Lord that you might be more drawn to him. Look for ways to engage the immensely interesting living God in prayer. He really is more interesting than those things our minds want to focus on, if we could only recognize it. He's really much more interesting than doing the Sudoku puzzle that's caught our attention, or looking at this television show, or um, you know, breezing through the cookbook at the latest you know, things that I might do here, or whatever it might be surfing the web about some particular topic, looking for that cruise you know, that I, I, I imagine I'd like to go on. Mm -hmm. However interesting those things are, the Lord really is more interesting. Let's pray that he'd make himself more interesting to us because he is more interesting. If we only knew, we would have a hard time focusing on anything else. And that's part of growing in our depth of relationship with him to move beyond the more superficial attractions and distractions and to come to greater love and genuine fascination with the Lord. Pray that he might make it so. Okay, secondly, the area of dryness. Sometimes our affective life, our emotional life, is flat. Or even more, it's depressed. There's not much going on, and so oh, it's hard to get excited or interested in prayer. It's a great gift, we know, to experience our emotions serving us in prayer. What a blessing when we're joyful and caught up and thrilled about prayer. It's great help. God gave us our emotions, as we know, to be a great source of help to us. But we can lose our taste for spiritual things. Sometimes it seems like the Lord is distant or even absent to us, even though we are earnestly seeking him. He's just not quite there the way he once was. Where did he go? He's just not around. The key thing here is to be faithful and press through. Everyone goes through periods of dryness, and sometimes they can last a while. Now, it's possible that when prayer is dry, it's because we are distracted and we've lost our first love. We've, we haven't been faithful or diligent in prayer. There was uh, one of the brothers who was in formation with us in our house who, uh, a little while back, was, yeah, he was talking about prayer just not being all that great and the Lord, being, the Lord was not speaking to him much. He hasn't heard the Lord much. Okay, well, all right, well, you know, press through. And, and then, you know, as we worked together and as things were going on and, and the Lord worked in his life more deeply, the reason for that became clear. It's because he, uh, he was kind of holding out on the Lord a little bit and actually not giving himself fully. And he really needed a deeper conversion. And when that came, prayer really changed. So he was saying the language of, you know, I'm praying and God's just not there. Okay. And in his case, I think it was because he was not there with the commitment of his life. And he was holding back on the Lord. And the Lord, guess what? Isn't there when you're not there with your own heart. That may be one reason, and it's worth at least asking and examining ourselves if in some way we're choking out the Lord by genuinely being caught up with other things. The, the parable of the seed where the anxieties and cares and, and pleasures of this life choke the good seed that grows. That can happen to us. And you say, you know, the Lord's been kind of distant and I don't experience him much. Just maybe it's because it's getting choked out and we ought to look at that 
And there your own brothers or your sisters could maybe also be a help to you to point that out. But often that's not the case. Often that's not the case. You may not be choking anything out. You're very earnestly seeking the Lord. And there's an experience of dryness and the absence of God. Here we have to trust the Lord that through this he's purifying and deepening our faith and our love by allowing us to experience a season of dryness. Deep wells are often dug during times of dryness in our lives that otherwise would never be dug out. Because the water is not near the surface, we have to dig deeper and we get access to much deeper underground springs that we would never need to dig for if everything were just right there at the surface every time we looked. So the Lord uses these even when we're earnest to draw us near to him. Finally, let's recall that spiritual warfare can be a source of distraction. We have to contend with the world and the evil one. We have a personal enemy who's intent on moving us away from prayer and we need to be alert to that. How often when you're going through a difficulty and you're just wondering, this is awful hard. What's going on and you're confused and someone says, you know, I think there might be some spiritual warfare here, so let's pray. And you go, of course that's it. Why didn't I think about that? Well, because the enemy is very good at not getting noticed and getting you distracted looking at something else. You attend to the spiritual warfare and suddenly the problem sort of clears up a good bit. Let's recall that we're in a battle and we've got a personal enemy. Let's maintain our spiritual mind aware of the attacks that can come on us. By the Spirit of God, he gives us the gifts we need and the words we need to be able to resist those attacks and press on. So distractions, dryness, spiritual warfare, some of the challenges that we face in prayer. Finally, I'd say, you know, know that if you struggle in your personal prayer time, in one way or another, you're really not alone. You're not the one person in the community that has trouble with this. If at times you just let it slip, or even for seasons, you're also not alone. Help and hope are available there, and if need be, this is a good season and time to recapture something in the way of daily prayer, of love for God, and of attentiveness to his, his word in scripture. Making use of the brothers and sisters here in the community can be very helpful. For instance, asking your own men's and women's group to ask you about it. How's it going? You know, one of the things I find quite helpful and charming, I'll be caring for a man and he'll say, hey, would you ask me about this every time we meet or regularly? That would really help me if you'd ask me about this because I have trouble with this. And if you just keep me, sure. You know, and sometimes, hey, you're not asking me about this. Oh, sorry, uh, how's this? Well, let me tell you about it. <laughs> Um, it helps to ask and it can, it's helpful to say to your brothers and sisters, I'm having trouble here. I could both use some wisdom, but ask me about it because I, that would help me. It's also helpful to get prayer from them for areas of entering into personal prayer, fighting through dryness or discouragement, lack of hope, overcoming some area of sin that's keeping you out of a right relationship with the Lord, whatever that might be. The brothers and sisters are a resource here in our personal prayer time, even if they're not there taking it with us. They can help us get in a place to be able to take it well and benefit from it. Before uh, coming to a conclusion, let me just say briefly, uh, highlighting what I've mentioned before, that there really are different seasons in prayer. I spoke earlier about there being um, various ways to pray. I want to just say here a little more clearly that there really are different seasons in prayer. And the way we were led to pray, we might have been praying when we were 18 or 23, might be quite different than we're praying when we're uh, 37 and have a bunch of kids at home, or when we're 59 and the kids are all gone, or when we're 72 and have a very different quality and style of life. Um, there really are different stages and seasons in prayer. That's fine and normal. That's part of the Lord taking us through our lives and working, us, working with us as we go. I found a terrific analogy with this a few years back. I, I picked up as a gift, in fact, for uh, one of my nephews, a book of the, um, the Lewis and Clark expedition. It was the anniversary and they, they published uh, f a 400 page book that was a summary of their journals. I think their journals were like three times as long. And they picked out the best stuff, 400 pages just of their journal entries. 
what a, I mean, very interesting story on its own. But there was something about it that I found really interesting. When they started out, um, I think they began in St. Louis when they got everyone together. Their first while was on relatively flat, wide rivers, fairly well settled. Lots of people to help, fair bit of game. And it's actually as they went along and it, as it were got more experienced that they found it a lot harder. Not because they were in a worse spot, but because the terrain became much harder. They got out into the wilderness. They were, they were in places where there was no longer nearly the help. Then they hit the mountains and they could not get through without the help of the, of the, the native Indians. They would have either died there or had to turn back. And I found this helpful. It's like, you know, you, you think that going through life it ought to be the hardest at the beginning, and it ought to always just get easier. But it often doesn't work that way. And that's not because we're going backwards. It's because the Lord's taking us onto different kinds of terrain, where in fact, he's bringing us to harder places where we need him more, we need others more, and we might need to, you know, the, the gradient going up is a lot steeper, and we have to work a lot harder to get less ground in a certain way. Different stages of life, we need to meet the Lord in those stages in a way appropriate to them. I think part of the art and the grace of moving through life is knowing and learning how to do that, gaining wisdom from one another, and not falling prey to the idea that somehow prayer either always ought to be the same or it just simply ought to be easier. If indeed the Lord is calling us into higher terrain to take more ground, we might struggle more in ways that we didn't have to before, but that's because the Lord's bringing us to a higher place. And that ought to encourage us, in fact. As we grow in our relationship with the Lord, we progress through different stages in prayer. And this simply reflects the reality of our being drawn more deeply in our relationship with the Lord. Okay, a few words just in conclusion then. We're taking this time, this season, these couple of years in the sword of the Spirit to renew our practice of personal prayer. This is what we've centered on in these two talks. Obviously, a personal prayer time is a means to an end and not an end in itself. The goal of our life isn't to take a personal prayer time. It's like, I achieved the goal of my life. I prayed every day. That's all I needed to do. It's a means to an end, isn't it? It's not just an end in itself. The goal is to grow in our relationship of love with the Lord and to share more fully in bringing his kingdom about in that state of life he's called us to. Our prayer time then is meant to help secure in a daily way, in a weekly way, a greater focus on the Lord throughout the day. It's a, it's a way to say every day, this is what my life is about. This is really the core and the center. I need reminding of that. I need to call that to mind in this world where things are thick and dark. I need to have that place where I'm clear on who I am, who God is, and where I'm going. To come back to that opening prayer that comes from our, our covenant, you know, may the Lord make of us a people who love him and who love to pray. I, I pray that that might be something that, that's true of all of us, that we do love the Lord and we love to pray, even if we do that in many different ways. That's the desire his spirit gives us. May we always be that people who grow by his great mercy in that first love that he has given us, he who is our all. Amen. We'll end there and we'll take time to discuss these things. Please.